Well, hello everyone. So today we begin delving in to the content presented in the textbook by Ketora et al, titled International Marketing. Chapter one covers the scope and challenge of international marketing. Our learning objectives for this chapter include the benefits of international markets, learning about the changing face of US business and the scope of the international marketing task. We're also going to begin to learn about the self-reference criterion in international marketing and the increasing importance of global awareness. And then we end up the chapter with identifying the progression of becoming a global marketer. So we begin the chapter with an outline on how global commerce causes peace when, um, when it's peaceful times, global commerce thrives. And we saw this in North America in the late 1990s. At that time, we were experiencing, as, as the world as a whole was experiencing the end of the Cold War, and former communist countries were opening to uh, world trading systems, which had not happened previously. Okay, in peaceful times, international trade is important because uh, there's a lack of consistent and predictable trade policies. When there's a lack of consistent and predictable trade policies, that can lead to tension. So international trade is very important for this reason, as well as that many world events affect trade. So company scandals and layoffs, wars and political unrest, natural disasters, financial and economic disruptions, and populist developments, as we've seen, for example, with the Brexit vote in the UK and Trump in the US. So for these reasons, international trade is very important. And um, when we have stability and uh, in international trade, we have peace. So there's four trends affecting global business. Well, growth of the World Trade Organization and open trade agreements in block sectors across the world. Emerging economies moving towards free trade. The internet, cellular and networked communications and a mandate to manage the global environment for the future. So, as an example of where um, commerce generates peaceful times, we have evidence of um, uh, the connection between North and South Korea with the example of uh, rail transportation. This is deemed a first step towards peaceful um, relations between North and South Korea. Now let's talk about the internationalization of US business. So, above and beyond the domestic US market, globalization of US businesses is increasing because more foreign customers, competitors, and suppliers are coming into the American market. And there's also growing competition from domestic and foreign firms. So for these reasons, there is a globalization of the US business. There, are, there is also much foreign control in US businesses. Foreign direct, direct, foreign, direct, foreign direct investment in the US is above 3 trillion currently. And foreign owned companies are evident throughout uh, various industries, including the automobile industry, the um, white goods appliances industry, convenience stores and restaurants, news as entertainment, as well as hospitality. Here are examples of foreign acquisitions of US companies. And the list goes on to a second page. All right, we also have examples of 
Mexican brands coming north into the US with, for example, Grupo Bimbo, which is a growing Mexican multinational that has purchased American brands such as Sara Lee and Mrs. Baird's Bread. Now, American brands have a global reach and it's important for US businesses to thrive by reaching into the international market. In many cases, foreign sales exceed domestic sales and foreign investments generate revenue with, for example, uh, Apple in 2016 generated 2.15 billion and 60% of that was from international sales. So here's a list of US companies and their respective international sales. These uh, figures are from 2016 and when we're in class we'll talk about more updated figures. So what is international marketing exactly? Well, it's about the performance of business and where we are planning, pricing, promoting the direct flow of goods and services for profit across geographic boundaries. And it's international in the sense that we're targeting consumer segments beyond the domestic market. However, in, in international marketing is unique from domestic marketing in that there's many unique uh, challenges associated with moving into the international market. And there's a level of uncertainty and uncontrollable factors that are not found in domestic markets, but are definitely part of foreign markets. So that's part of what we're gonna learn about this semester. What do we do in terms of international marketing? Well, I just mentioned the uncontrollable uncertainty. We need, we as international marketers need to learn how to manage these uncontrollable elements to the best of our abilities. We need to know what's within our control and what's without. And each international market has um, its own set of factors. So it varies across geographies. We'll talk about this graphic in class. Okay, so marketing decision factors in international marketing. A marketing program is designed for optimal adjustment to the uncertain environment. So within the domestic environment, we have um, elements that we can that we can use to anticipate demand, but that can alter, um, we can alter the marketing mix elements if needed, according to um, changing market conditions, changing consumer preferences and corporate objectives. So this, these marketing mix elements are more controllable in the domestic market. When we go into the international market, um, then it's not so easily controlled. We need to actively evaluate our marketing mix elements that we have put into place and make adjustments um, according to what those evaluations show, right? So we devise the marketing mix and implement those marketing mix elements. We evaluate what we've implemented and we monitor the market so that we make the adjustments. All right. And essentially what we're trying to do is keep the organization on track. So in the domestic uh, environment, the macro domestic environment, we are talking about political and legal forces, economic climate forces, competitive forces, technological innovation, uh, structure of distribution networks, uh, geography and infrastructure, and cultural forces. And these same elements are evident in the foreign market, but um, they are more complicated when you're outside the realm of the domestic market. So emerging markets such as China and India and the Philippines have proved very resilient 
um, in since the financial crisis in 2008. And for this reason, organisations such as Citibank have moved into, for example, Brazil. So we need to, as international marketers, we need to monitor and adapt to the changing market conditions. So as international marketers, our duties in, include interpreting these uncontrollable elements on the market. We need to adjust our marketing efforts to the cultures that we are operating to within and we may not be attuned to. We need to be aware of our own frame of reference as well. All right, so what I'm talking about there is the self-reference criterion and ethnocentrism. These are two different things. The self-reference criterion is about an unconscious reference to our own cultural values, experiences and knowledge. And it's problematic, this self-reference criterion is problematic when it's used as a basis for decisions. Um, ethnocentrism is rife in the US and that is about um, considering one's own country, culture, or uh, one's own country or culture that is the best. And it's most problematic when affluent countries work with less affluent countries. So we need to be vigilant across these um, potentially limiting aspects of ourselves. We need to define the situation within the home country so that um, we are aware of the cultural traits, habits and norms that we may or may not take and try and unconsciously transfer into uh, international markets. We need to understand, cult we need to develop cultural competency and understand the cultural traits uh, of the international markets that we're seeking to operating, operate in. We need to isolate our self-reference criterion influence in situations and carefully examine how it may unconsciously complicate issues. And we need to redefine our situations um, without that bias so that we can solve business problems in an optimal manner. So when we're developing a global awareness, what we're doing is developing a tolerance and willingness to learn about cultural differences. We're um, developing our knowledge of culture across cultures and across histories, across world markets and global um, as, as social and political trends that we may otherwise not have been aware of. So there's stages of international involvement and the main characteristics of companies that internationalize quickly have high technology and marketing based resources, smaller home markets and larger production capacities and managers who have high level of cultural competency. These stages of international marketing involvement also, invo also include more reactive and less strategic. So no direct foreign marketing and infrequent foreign marketing. Um, and then we move on to um, a, a more comprehensive stage where we're more involved in the strategic planning. So regular foreign marketing, international marketing and global marketing. So basically in this slide, we're talking about going from a less developed stage of optimal international marketing where we have no foreign, no direct foreign marketing experience or maybe infrequent. And then we're moving on to more strategic planning where we're more au fait with operating in the global markets that we um, uh, are trying to operate in. Okay, we're going to leave it there for chapter one and thank you for your attention. I look forward to meeting you all in class.